Hi, uh, good morning. As I've been introduced, my name is Felipe. I'm a lead developer at Spotify in, in Sweden, in Stockholm, even though from my name you can see I'm not Swedish, I'm from Brazil. I've been living there for five years and working at Spotify for this whole time. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, our desktop application at Spotify and how we've been going to going through the years evolving it and using web technologies. So before I start, I'd like to see a bit, uh, quick show of hands of who of you work with JavaScript or web development in general. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, Spotify is not available in Ukraine yet, but I assume you are a bit familiar with the concept. I'm going to talk a bit about how the product has evolved during the years, too. Uh, so just to start, uh, as the topic of my presentation is that Spotify for desktop uh, uses web technologies to, to show the UI. And this is something that's getting really common nowadays. Many apps are using it. Uh, GitHub has released uh, a framework called Electron that lets JavaScript developers do that really easily. We don't use Electron, we use something similar. I'm going to talk about it uh, uh, later today. Uh, so you can see this, the same standards happening, for example, in the Atom editor or Visual Studio Code or Slack, the, the chat application, or even uh, Steam, the gaming platform. They all use this kind of web rendering in the desktop application. And uh, it has been a trend that many companies have been following because it simplifies a lot the development of, of desktop applications. And even Microsoft has been putting some effort on creating what they call the, the universal apps, that are apps that you can build using web technologies and use the same code base in desktop, and Xbox, and Windows Phone. So it's something that's really growing a lot recently. So before telling you, describing you how we are today in our architecture and our code base, I'm going to go a bit to the beginning of the story of our product to show how it evolved during the, during the years. So this is a really, like, 10 years ago, uh, 2006, two guys in Sweden got together and they had this idea of a product that would be similar to iTunes, but in the cloud. So you basically, this is like one of their first draws of how it should look like. And uh, basically what, what they wanted the users to have is like, have a software that you can listen to music that looks like it's on your computer, but it's actually in the cloud. So you can have access to all the music in the world. And uh, you can use it for free because it can be uh, with ads, or you should pay for it and then get rid of the ads and have some extra features. And uh, at the time, uh, piracy was really like taking down the whole music industry. So the, this idea had a lot of potential because it could actually save the music industry. And uh, then that was 2006, and two years after that, 2008, Spotify finally got released to, the, to some countries in Europe. And uh, the reason it took two years was not, not just because of technology challenges, but much more the business side of it. Because imagine that you are changing one market that's really traditional, that has been around for decades. So the mentality of those right holders was not really aligned to the internet. They, they always thought that the internet was not good for their business. So there was a lot of negotiations to be able to actually release our software. And then this was the first version of the desktop application. And uh, at this point, we didn't use any web technologies yet. It was all in C++. And uh, yeah, it used some uh, UI libraries built in-house. So everything was pretty custom. It was not really anything very standard. And then a uh, few years have passed, like two or three years more. And then there was a lot of interest from developers to build things around Spotify. There was a need to create a community around Spotify of developers and apps that could use those features. So Spotify really is a, a platform where you could build uh, something that would run inside the client. So you could build an app that uh, suggests music and, this, and users could use your app inside the Spotify client. Uh, in order to provide that, 
we had to have a platform that allowed people to develop on. And then the, the easiest way to do that was to use web technologies. Uh, so what we did at this point, we started uh, using web views inside the client and offering an API uh, in JavaScript that uh, developers could use to interact with our client. So we had this platform that was open to third-party developers that uh, they could just pretty much build a web page and use some specific APIs that they could control our client and like control the playback, access the, the user playlist and things like that. Uh, this, this platform no longer exists. Like we, we changed our strategy with developers because this strategy was not really, in the long term, didn't prove itself to be beneficial for us or for developers. So nowadays, if you want to develop things with Spotify, there are some SDKs that you can use to embed Spotify inside your app instead of the other way around. So there are some SDKs that you can, uh, on your iPhone app or on Android app, you can integrate with, with Spotify from your app. But at this point, we built all the, the, the platform for this to have web views inside your client. And then we started using that for our internal views also because we wanted to validate the model. So we, we needed to have uh, web render inside the client. And five years ago, there was no Electron. There was no Node WebKit. The main uh, library for that at that time was called Ceph. And uh, Ceph stands for Chromium Embedded Framework. So it is a, a C++ framework that you can embed in your, in your application to be able to render web views. And uh, that's something that we started using at that point. And then it's an open source project that other people can use as well. And some other companies do. Uh, like Steam, the gaming platform, they use the same framework as, as we do. And uh, the difference from, from Ceph to Electron, for example, is that uh, Electron, you can do everything in JavaScript. In Ceph, we still have a lot of C++ that instantiates it and uh, allows it to, to work. So at this, time, as, at this point, it had like a hybrid uh, interface. There were some, uh, the whole client was still like C++, but we had in the middle, it was rendering HTML and JavaScript. And then, uh, more time passed, like two years more or something like that, and then we needed to do a, a redesign. And uh, the whole colors of the client uh, were changing, like we're going from gray to black, and then there was a UI changes everywhere, the whole design language has been changing. And then uh, the, when we, when we used uh, C++ for UI, there was a lot of complications to update, because there was a lot of old legacy code, and uh, we had to maintain two code bases for UI, the C++ and the HTML version. And also at this time, the, we started seeing those Retina screens available on laptops. So uh, you have high DPI, and then our C++ code base didn't support that. So we need to, to add support to our UI libraries, while the web rendering already supported. So you could open the client, and you'd see like the web views would, would be rendered fine in, the, in high DPI, but the, the native ones were a bit blurry. So it was a bit not not ideal experience, but still we, we still kept in this version there was hybrid so it was native and and HTML, and then uh, we had another iteration in the client and then uh, it looked really similar to the previous version, but we made one big change in our stack. Basically, we moved everything that was UI related to, to web technologies. So now we have the whole UI uh, based on web technologies. And uh, one of the, the ways for us to validate that, that this iteration was successful is actually we didn't want users to notice the change. So we wanted to do this change and make sure that no metric is affected. And we just want to make sure that people keep using and don't really notice that because uh, the main concern has always been performance, but nowadays web rendering is already like on par with, at least from a human perception, you cannot really notice the difference if it's well done. And then when you face this kind of challenge uh, in a software, you, you face a dilemma. Like you have a node code base that works and serves a purpose, but you want to replace that by a new thing. 
And this is, this is something that happens a lot. That happens a lot in every company in the world, pretty much. Like you have this old code base that works, but doesn't, uh, it's not really great, and you would like to throw it away and do something new. But it's usually seen as an anti-pattern, something that you shouldn't do, because you are adding a lot of risk to your project. You are throwing away things that work, and you are adding new bugs that you don't know yet. So that's the reason that, for example, banks, they keep their old systems for like a code base that's 40 years old. They just patch the, this COBOL uh, code base because they don't really want to throw it away and build something new because there's too much risk involved on that. So there's usually many reasons not to rewrite the, our, our C++ code that, that worked. And then when you have this kind of discussions about rewriting old code, those things can be a bit emotional also because people who have been working on it, they are attached to that code base, they think, okay, that's the way it's supposed to do. Then you have this new person that joins, no, this is all wrong, we should throw it away and do something new. And then there's some things that, that people uh, forget about the pragmatic aspect of it and then just think about how they feel about that code base and then they, they let that affect their opinion about the code base. So we, we needed to find a way to apply a way of analyzing the situation in a more objective uh, way, a, a way of thinking like an engineer. And then what engineers do is like they analyze the trade-offs. They see the benefits and the costs. They try to optimize the process and their product and then take the most out of it. Uh, and uh, always uh, trying to, to compensate for the cost by something that actually brings a big benefit. So how, how could we, we do that? We need to analyze the trade-offs. So what are we investing and what are we going to take out of it? And then we noticed like we, we had this project that we would have a, a big cost because we would be stopping the development of new features to replace this old code. So it was a cost. But also in the long term, the maintenance of this code base would be much cheaper. So it would compensate for that. So, and then also, uh, we had, uh, it's easier to find people to work with web technologies than with C++, for example. So it would be easier to grow our teams. It would be easier for us to, like, as a company, we believe a lot in the data. So we make tests and see how users behave. And then based on this, those results, we take the direction of, of our product. So, for example, we do a lot of A-B tests. So let's put this button blue for some users and green for other users and see w what they click the most. And then, then we take the final decision. So everyone's going to be green because green was more effective, for example. And then when you have a more flexible way of developing those tests, it really brings a lot of benefit for us. So that, that was one of the things that we also considered. It was easier for us to do this kind of test if you use a more flexible uh, technology stack. And then also, there were some other things that would gain for free, like, as I said before, the, the retina screens. Like, we didn't need to work on anything to make it work properly in retina screens if you just use the web technologies. And also, the accessibility part of it. Like, uh, some users that have visual impairments, they need screen readers to read the screen for them. And then when you use web technologies, those things work much better than when you use non-web like, native technologies. So, we would be serving better some of our users also. So we decided to go ahead with that, that change in our project, the, our change in architecture. And I'm going to talk a bit about how we did that in terms of implementation, uh, how we structured our code base and our layers to make sure that this thing happened. So I'm going to... Uh, this is pretty much the, the, the layers of our client and then, and then uh, how, the, those, how the architecture is structured. And then I'm going to explain a bit from the bottom to the top how those things behave and what they do. So in the bottom of everything, we have a client core. And uh, client core is a, is a library written in C++ that's shared among all our platforms like Android, iOS, and desktop. They use the same code base for the core. And the core, what it does is basically the basic functionalities of Spotify. It handles the, the streaming of the audio, the decoding of the audio, the integration of audio drivers in your operating system, 
offline syncing and many lower level things that are common to our platform that's done in, in, in core. So it's C++ and then on Android, it has some bindings for, for Java and Objective-C it works kind of out, out of the box and then on desktop also out of the box. And uh, on top of that, we have like what they call the client desktop. So it's the code that is specific to desktop. So for example, how we create a window on Mac, how we create a window on Windows, how we integrate with the media keys, the keyboard from Windows and from Mac, these kind of things that are more specific to each platform. So that's the second layer. And uh, just one comment about the client core. Uh, as it is a, a code base that's shared by many teams, many, many platforms like Android, iOS, and desktop, it's also maintained by different teams. So different teams may, uh, are responsible for core. So there are developers who work in the desktop application that contribute to core, iPhone and Android Day. It's a shared ownership of that code base. While the client desktop is just belongs to the desktop infrastructure team. So the client desktop also responsible for uh, instantiating the, the web rendering and making it possible to communicate with core. So uh, the Chromium Embedded Framework, that's the open source project that I mentioned before, it is used by client desktop to render the, our, our web views. So client desktop makes sure that some APIs from core are exposed to JavaScript through Chromium. So basically what you have is almost like REST interfaces that you can say, okay, play this playlist or play this artist from JavaScript and JavaScript doesn't really care how it is played, it just sends this command and then core executes it. Uh, and then, yeah, Chromium Embedded Framework I just talked about, it's, it is the, the framework that allows us to render this, this uh, web views. And uh, on top of it, there is the JavaScript container. It's basically uh, the things that were in, in C++ before that manage the whole UI, how you navigate, how you re represent the playback state, like progress bar, uh, playback control, and things like that. Those are the, the JavaScript container. And then it, it manages all the features in the client. And uh, these three layers, like JS container, Chrome Embedded Framework, Client Desktop, they're all uh, maintained by a single team. That's my team, the desktop infrastructure team. <coughs> and uh, on top of it, you have the little boxes, the, red, the pink boxes. And those are the specific features. So uh, you have a feature that you can uh, use playlists, another feature that you can go to artist views, albums, etc. And they all are maintained by their own teams. And uh, as I said before, when I talked about the platform, they, they used to be like sandboxed in these in this little web views that don't really care about the rest. They are like isolated. So they, each, each one of them belong to a, a different team that maintains it. And uh, yeah, they are also in JavaScript and they are, they are managed by the container that instantiates and kills them when it's necessary. So just, just so you understand a bit, a more visual way of seeing it, uh, you have the container that manages the whole state and then the, the apps that are managed by different teams. So you have in the middle the browse app where you can navigate and see things that are happening right now. It's maintained by a team and then you have like the social feed on the right hand side which that's also maintained by a different team and they're all sandboxed. And uh, the way you do sandbox and the way we did before is by using iframes because it allows us to, for every uh, app to, to have their own document. The, the whole DOM belongs to them and uh, the whole global scope for JavaScript also belongs to them. And uh, iframes are a bit polemic because they are seen really in a negative way in most of the cases because they're usually used for injecting third-party scripts and they have a high memory footprint and things like that. So uh, why, why did we use iframes? Uh, the reason we did it is because it was the easiest way for us to isolate different views in the client. And uh, also there are some, some, more, some other reasons, for example, when we were rewriting the, 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 the things that are in iframes nowadays, have always been using web technologies. They nev have never been C++ before. They just, the JS container was C++ and we migrated. And then when we were migrating 
uh, we didn't want to affect the features because it would uh, increase a lot the risk of things going bad if you have to rewrite all the things inside the client. So we kept them isolated as components and treat them as black boxes. And then so we could, we could rewrite the container and reduce the risks. So iframes allowed us to kind of don't take into consideration what each feature was doing because just consider them as iframes, so reduce the risks. And uh, also allow the teams working on them to not be affected by the migration of the container because they just kept developing their things as they, as they always did. And uh, there is also something that uh, is a bit uh, you don't normally think about, but Spotify is a bit different than a normal website. Because when you have a website in your browser, you close the tab you know, once a day or something. Or after a few hours, you see a website, you close it. But uh, we have like a music player that is in the background. Sometimes you never restart your computer, never close the window. So it's going to be there for days or for weeks maybe open. And then that can cause a lot of memory leaks if you just like, leave things running. And uh, when we use iframes, uh, even though the memory footprint for one iframe is a bit high. You could just kill the iframes when they are not being used and then you're already releasing memory. So that's also something that is, is beneficial. So there, there were reasons for, for using it. Of course, moving forward, we might reconsider it and try to remove iframes, and that's something that we are working for. But for the migration period, it, it made sense to get, keep them for a you know, more pragmatic way of approaching things. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about how we structure our code base, because that's something that I think the, the part of this talk that's more applicable to, to other projects and people can actually think about how they're building their stuff and uh, learn from what we didn't work and things that we did that didn't work and maybe you were in a, in a similar situation. So when, when we started our project, we did a really normal way of organizing code base. So we had uh, Every app that's a VO had one repository in Git. And uh, we also have some internal libraries that we use. For example, we have one library that has all our uh, UI components, so the, the CSS or how the, the buttons should look like, uh, the, the variables for the color, so the, our, tone, our shade of green and things like that. And so it's in one library. We also have another library that uh, parses our internal URI so we can navigate into the client. And then we also had, and then we had this libraries package as npm modules, and uh, we had an internal npm registry that we published and distributed all these libraries, except that that didn't work for us very well. And then uh, that's kind of surprising because it's what, how most projects are developed in JavaScript these days, like small modules, they're all isolated and componentized. And, uh, why didn't it work? Like everything seems really uh, encapsulated, and every team had their own repositories. And uh, the reason it didn't work is that it was really hard to coordinate big changes that affected many features. So, for example, imagine that you wanted to change how a button looks, and then this button is used in many places in the client. If it is just in one module, you have to change the the, the module that has the button and make sure that all the modules that depend on it get the latest. So you had to coordinate all of these things uh, with, with different teams working together because it's this team that is responsible for one module that needs to communicate to all the other teams that use this module and things like that. So uh, it was really hard to coordinate those things. And uh, also sometimes you have like a, almost a cascade effect because there is several levels of dependency that you need to bump in order to, to coordinate those changes. So it was kind of hard to manage as we have the releases quite frequently, every two weeks in our case. Uh, there was always this overhead of, of communicating and trying to make sure everyone had like recent builds of all the modules and things like that. Uh, it also complicated uh, our continuous in the integration system because for the same reason I talked about before, like the dependencies, like imagine that you build we have, we have the build pipeline for all those repositories. And we do have a continuous integration set up for our, all of our code base. So whenever you commit something, you want the build to run and make sure everything works. And uh, what we, want, we needed to do in this case is have several levels of dependencies, like 
have a, a pretty much a graph of 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 build pipelines that like if I build this, it should also build this after and make sure that everything works. So it was really hard to have a, a full picture if your changes wasn't breaking something in the other side of the of the of the system, which made testability really hard because there was no visibility uh, on how your changes were affecting other people, even though you can use like semantic versioning and things like that, they don't always work. And uh, it was also hard to to make standard, uh, standardize the practices in our in our teams because like I have several teams working, they all work in their little components, and they all do things in the way they think is correct. And then uh, people move around to different teams, and other team does things differently. Or you have uh, new people coming into the company, and then they want to understand how we do things, and there is not really an answer because every team does it differently. So we wanted to unify more the way we do things, and then this strategy was a bit didn't really help much. So basically, for example, we had like our components, our features, like have like the playlist feature, and it depended one version of our CSS library, one version of our URI library, have the radio that had different versions, and they needed to go out in the same release. So what happened, for example, if the CSS1 and CSS2 are different, have a different uh, shade of green, for example, for the, for the, the, the pro progress bar or something that we do, uh, when every one of those would have their own build pipeline and they would have like a different green, and then when you load the client, you go to playlist, you see this green, and you go to radio, you see another green. So it was a bit hard to coordinate those things. So what we did is like, let's get all the repositories and move to a single one. Let's have one repository that has all the current state. So this is something that is called, many companies are adopting, it's called monorepo. And uh, like Google does it, Facebook does it, Twitter does it. The, what they do is like they have all their code base in a single repository. And uh, it already mitigates a lot of the problems I've talked before. Because you're going to have everything centralized. You can have like a single build pipeline and you can have visibility for all your changes. Even though you still can have different packages inside that repository. But you have all the code base in a single, single place. So what it does, what it solves for us that it simplified the continuous integration because you make one change and then the whole code base is built. So there is no dependency to be concerned about. You are at like in a single build, you are already validating everything. So it was really e much easier to, to, to check the impact of your changes because uh, when you change an API, all the consumers of your API are in the same repository. You can just grab for it and gonna see where it's being used. So you can have an idea of how, how your change is affecting other people. And uh, you become free to break backwards compatibility because you can just break it and fix whatever it's being used. And then it simplifies a lot the code because you don't re really need to keep old APIs inside your code base. You can just remove them and remove and, and fix whatever it's being used. And uh, it allows us to do atomic refactorings. And what I mean by that is like there is no broken state in between. Like you change an API and you change the consumers of the API in the same git commit. So if that doesn't work, you can also like revert in a single commit. It's not like many commits that depend on each other and it's gonna be hard to coordinate. And uh, as we have everything centralized in a single repository, it's much easier to make things consistent and standardize the practices uh, across the board. Like the whole company, the, all the developers working in this, this project, they, they follow the same practices, they use the same tools. So it's like right now what we have like this box, that's the repository of all the features and all the dependencies. So they, they all have the same dependencies and they, they're, the generated artifacts of the build uh, are still the same format as before, but they just fetch from the same dependencies so we solve the, the consistency problem. So things got much simpler than before, but there's still a lot of entropy that we needed to solve. Like we just got different parts of our code base and put them together, but there are still problems that we needed to solve in terms of uh, fixing, unifying the way people build things at our, at our company. So we created something that we call the golden path. And uh, the golden path is pretty much some documentation on the best practices, things that everyone should follow so we could follow the same standards. Like we have in this project specifically, there are not that many developers, like 30, 40 developers. 
for Spotify, it's not the biggest pro project, like in iOS and more people, for example. But uh, we still needed to make sure that all those people are working in the same way because it simplifies a lot everyone's life. So before I, I move to that, like what, what the golden path means is like you have these guidelines on how we should build things. Uh, and you are not you don't really need to follow them. Like you can still do things your way. But if you do things your way, you are not being supported by infrastructure teams who are supposed to build tools and uh, set up things and make sure that the, the test environment is working fine and those things. Like if you're doing things your own way, you have no support. But if you follow the guidelines, all the tools are already there for you. So you can focus just on building your feature. You don't really need to think about libraries and tools around that. You can feature. think just about the, the, the business logic that you need to, to work on. So the way we, we try to do that is we put together what we call a standardization work group. So uh, instead of having just the infrastructure team uh, defining what everyone should use, we actually got one person from each team to discuss what, what they think works. So bring everyone together to hear different points of views and opinions and come up with the general guidelines that everyone should follow. And uh, when we started analyzing our code base, was, we saw that many things were already pretty common across different teams. There were already some standards that are already there just because people prefer to do things in that way. Like which testing framework, unit testing framework we're going to use. So we saw like in our projects, like 80% of, of the teams used Mocha, for example. Some other teams used uh, Tape or something else. And then, okay, but 80% is already using Mocha. So the rest should use Mocha as well because it's just simpler uh, to, to to make the migration. If things don't work, it's easier to migrate from one single thing to another single thing than to actually have fragmentation. Uh, so we, we, we try to stick to those standards that are already there instead of like reinventing and make sure that everyone doesn't need to migrate things. And uh, when you're making decisions on guidelines, how we should do things, we usually don't just look for uh, what would the, the perfect library to use for this, but we actually want someone, some teams that have experienced that before. So we cannot just say, okay, everyone should rewrite everything in this framework. Uh, doesn't really work like that. Like we need some team to have been working with it and it has worked for them. So we can use that in, as an example for other teams to follow. So it's a data-driven decision making. We actually experiment before actually taking final decisions. And then as I said, like teams are not uh, obliged to yeah, it's not mandatory for them to, to follow those guidelines, but it's like, it's, it's their guidelines because they're going to get more support from it. So all of that, uh, just highlighting the lessons learned in this process. Uh, the first lesson we learned in this, in this whole process is that you should always evolve things incrementally. So you have like this big, big change that you want to do in your software, uh, and then you shouldn't actually try to solve all the problems at once. Try to take baby steps and always release really often to your users because that's when you get actual feedback. So make small improvements and keep releasing and, and checking how your improvements affect your users and your product in general. So don't wait to solve other problems and make a big release in the end. That's going to be really hard because if you're doing something wrong, it's going to take a long time for you to notice. If you're just taking small steps and making sure that everything works and then your users are happy and they keep using our product, you can s see that we're going in the right path. But if you're just like, you know, going to stop the, stop the releases for the next six months, I'm going to work on this, and after six months, I'm going to release this big bang that is going to change everything. And then after those six months, you release and then you see that things didn't work. You just lost six months. So try to make small changes and always ship to your users. Uh, many companies have centralized infrastructure teams, as it's our case. And uh, in some cases, those infrastructure teams are really like dictators. They, they say how people should build things. And uh, in our experience, you shouldn't do that because it's much easier to get sympathy from the developers if, if you involve them in the decisions. So and as an infrastructure team, you should listen to the developers in your company and see what their, their actual needs are because sometimes infrastructure teams tend to solve problems that don't really exist or in a way that doesn't really help other developers and their job is to help other developers to be more productive. So infrastructure teams need to understand more and be more in touch 
with people who are building features for the final users because they have problems to solve and the infrastructure should help them to solve those problems. And then uh, when I talked about the repositories, like you shouldn't let the way you organize your code building repositories dictate your architecture because that's not very flexible and architecture should be flexible. So in our case, moving everything to a single repository made things much more flexible because you don't have this this barrier of repositories. You can just like move things around where they make more sense, I think, like that. And uh, consistency is really important. It's really important that you keep one way of doing things in your code base. Uh, it's better to have one way that's not optimal than be experimenting everywhere to trying to find an optimal way and have your code base that is a mess. So try to keep a consistency always, especially if you have a big team and you want to grow your team, because imagine that you are bringing new people to your team and then you need to show these people how to do things. So for, the, for them to get up to speed quicker and more productive, you need to have like clear ways of, of doing things. So yeah, so that, that was pretty much it. So we had many challenges in the last years. We still have a lot of challenges in the future. So there are so many good people here that I couldn't miss the opportunity to say that we are still hiring a lot. So if you think those challenges are interesting to you, just take a look on this web page. You can talk to me after if you have any question about specific jobs. And uh, that's it. We have time for questions now. Yeah, we have uh, internal uh, tooling for, for A-B testing. We're not using any third party, it's so built internally. Yeah, so basically what we have is we have uh, a backend service, uh, because all our backend infrastructure is microservices. So we have this one specific service for A-B test. And then we can send this username to the service, and the service returns like a dictionary of all, all the, the, the tests, and the, if this user is in or not. So. There can be many tests running at once in the client. Like, there is a test for the color of a button, or the test if a user gets one feature or not. There are many, many different tests running in parallel. So you have this centralized place that stores all the A/B tests. So when the user logs in, the client says, "Okay, give me all the flags for this user," and then I, I customize the, the experience for this user. So you have this this service that keeps track of everything. Yeah, uh, we realize that there are di fundamental differences in, in backend and frontend. And then if you think about it, like for the final user, the client is one single thing, right? It, it is one product that you need to keep consistent. And uh, we, we tried at some point uh, independent releases for different features in the client. And uh, that caused a lot of headaches because there were so many different combinations of scenarios that users could face that was hard to, to, to test. For example, we do gradual releases. So we never open a feature to 100% of the users at, at the same time. We always like open this to 1% of the users, see how that works, and open to 5, to 10, to 50, to 100. Yeah, and then uh, what happens is like, Imagine that you have one feature that's open to 5% of the users, another feature that's open to 20% of the users. And then this happens in many features. And then you have like an exponential number of combinations of the scenarios that users could face. And then you, make, you try to think about that in the perspective of a QA who wants to make sure that users have a decent experience in the client. So it, it, it gave us a lot of problems. So we try to keep like two week release cycles for the client and make sure that we have a more testable, consistent version of every. And then uh, the, the, just because we have everything in a repository doesn't really mean that it is a monolithic architecture. It's actually, it's actually pretty componentized. It's just that they, they live in the same uh, directory tree. Yeah, I know, because in, the, in, this, in this release cycle, everything goes out at once. And then if it's not ready, it's, it's hidden be behind a feature flag. It just goes out when it's ready. Yeah. But all development happens in master. 
So it, we protect things behind feature flags. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, if you had uh, a chance to rewrite your Spotify desktop application from scratch, having unlimited time and resources, will you still use your current uh, setup? And if yes, uh, what is the more most upsetting uh, thing uh, you experience now? Uh, if you had all those wonderful things to, to take benefit from, uh, there were some things we would change. Uh, we would still do a monorepo thing. Uh, what we would change is instead of iframes and instead of having different libraries for things to do everything in a single way, because that's something that we're trying to go for. And then uh, the way we are moving things towards is going to use in more React as our basic framework. So uh, we are pretty much replacing. Uh, that's a project that's actually ongoing now. Like the whole idea of iframes and apps by actually React components because they, they do offer some level of, of logic separation. And then I think that would be the main difference uh, right now if you were to rethink the client. There are some internal proposals for that, but you cannot really stop and rewrite everything. So we do have to do things gradually. But that, that, that's the direction we are taking. Uh, what is Monorepa actually? Maybe it is uh, just all the code combined in one repo, or maybe is it a tool some clever tool uh, which help you to manage all these dependencies and mm. uh, maybe inject it to all the projects uh -huh. uh, so you, you'll you have uh, little effort. Yeah, so the idea of MonoRepo is just have everything in a single repo, but there are tools for it. Like if you look at how people develop the React framework or the Babel transpiler, they have a single repository with many NPM packages generated from this repository. And they have some tools for it. There's one called Lerna, I think that uh, they use in Babel and, and in, in React, that you have a single repository, but se separate packages, and you can gen generate releases of those packages. So yeah, the idea is one thing, but there are tools for it. First of all, thank you for good service. Nice, nice music. Uh, I want to ask, I don't know if you can answer it, but uh, you have a fucking good uh, Discover Weekly playlist. Closer, OK. Uh, so you have a Discover Weekly playlist. Uh, I don't know if you can answer it, but can you describe how algorithm behind it works? How it uh, might be in overview? Yeah, I can give some overview. I don't really have much details about the algorithm itself. But Discover Weekly is a really interesting thing at Spotify because it is a feature that was developed just by engineers, no product people involved. Like there was a hack week that people got together, they had this idea, and they built it. And then we, of course, we iterated on top of that. But the initial idea came up like that. And uh, what it does is basically uh, it analyzes your listening habits. And based on that, it makes suggestions. But uh, usually, those recommendation algorithms for music, what they do is like, you listen to these things, and other people who listen to these things also listen to something else. That's a really easy algorithm to implement. But what we've been doing in Discover Weekly is going beyond that, actually like comparing the actually actual audio files for the, com for the songs and seeing what kind of songs are similar, not just by metadata, but by the actual data. So that's something that generates better recommendations. So basically, what, what uh, Discovery Weekly does is analyze things that you've been listening for the last six months, I think. And then there are some things that it blacklists. For example, if you listen to a lot of uh, baby music, it's not going to be there. Because some people have kids, and they put like baby songs for the kids to sleep. And you don't really want some recommendations on your on your playlist because it's something that you want to listen at other times. So there are some, some things that it ignores, like kids' songs, for example. But basically what it does is analyze your habits and then take both the metadata for the tracks to find similar ones, but also the actual sound data and find something similar. So you mentioned you collect data about how people use uh, the application and what works better. Uh, how, how do you also engage people, engage user feedback how do you know if the interfaces or features you, you develop are actually you know, better than previous versions, or are they helping? Yeah, so we have the two things. We have the user research. We have a, a team at Spotify that's responsible for user research, that they actually contact users. And time they go to the person, your house to see how you use Spotify, to understand how your use cases are. So there are some people whose job is to do this kind of research, to talk to users, understand their needs, understand how they use the product. and. Uh, so they, they make some research, they invite them to the office, they say, okay, 
we are building new, this, this new thing. Can you try to do this thing in our client? I'm going to see how people behave, how going to people find this feature. So we actually observe how people are using have cameras sometimes filming how the person is using, where do they click? When I say, can you play a radio for these artists? And how do the user find the radio? So we do, we do have this kind of uh, user research that people actually volunteer to help us. And, uh, and then we also have like some logging on how people behave. And then it's more anonymized. And then you don't really have much control. But you can just see that, like, OK, people who have this button displayed here, they are 10% more probable to click on it than if it's there, this kind of thing. How you organize the QA process? So uh, full stack in the uh, terms that every engineer responsible for the delivery code, like do you have some process like TDD, BDD, I don't know. So what is actually the responsibility of engineer for each commit? Yeah, so usually it, it's up to each team, but usually we try to have a TDD approach or at least you do not necessarily need to write the test first. Some developers don't like to write the test first, and that's fine. But every change you make should be covered by tests. So you only test as like, we see testing as like a pyramid, right? So it's kind of classic. So the basis of the pyramid is the unit testing. So it's the thing that should have the most. And then on top of that, you have the integration test, that how the, your component integrates in a, with other components in a more, in a more uh, controlled way. And then on the top of that, you have like, the system test, that's like test the whole thing. We don't mock the, the back end. We actually make real requests to the back end and see how things behave. So we have like these three levels of tests. And then for unit and integration, usually the developer who builds the feature, uh, they are responsible for building those things. The system test, usually every team used to have a one person that specialized on building like the full stack system tests. So uh, no, the, the team that's responsible for playlists is going to have a uh, uh, some tests that go to the client, uh, uh, create a playlist, and check all the stack until the back end if everything has been created and things like that. So we have like these levels of tests. And then we also have manual tests. So for every release, we also, because so when you are testing user experience, it's really hard to automate everything. You cannot automate everything. So we have some, some manual testing also. For, so uh, in every release, some testers, every team usually has a tester, or there are some testers that share between teams. So they, they go to the client and they use all the features and see if everything is looking all right. Thank you for answer. <clears throat> One more question. Uh, I bet uh, everything technology that is here yeah, in uh, JS container um, yeah. is under ND, but uh, I want to ask um, maybe your own vision of the current modern stack for web, uh, maybe some frameworks or plain JavaScript, what's, what would be your approach if you uh, would start building Spotify right now? Mm. Maybe. Yeah, so JavaScript tools has, have evolved a lot. And it's kind of crazy to keep the pace and understand how things are, because they are always changing. And, but one thing that we've been adopting more and more, as I mentioned before, is the, the whole React ecosystem, because they have a really solid tools. They are really mature, and then they have really active development by a big company and a big open source community outside it. So that's, that's the, the ecosystem we've been betting more on. It's, it's the, the React one. So that's the direction we are going. And if we were to rewrite, we probably would take that also. We've been, uh, we have good relationship with some engineers at Facebook because we've built some things together, some integrations. And we've been in touch with them about React and uh, their plans. And they, they have really interesting ideas and how things should be and more and more organic growth on development based on what the community needs. So it, I think that, that's really nice. Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you for your presentation.